Welcome to The Sword on the Trial, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. Thanks so much for listening to The Sword on the Trial today. Before we get into the topic at hand, let me remind you that the Founders National Conference, Militant and Triumphant, is fast approaching. We're going to be gathering together down here in Southwest Florida, January 20th through the 23rd, as we consider the doctrine of the church. How desperately is it needed mm. right now? We've seen what's happened over the last 12 to 18 months as so many Christians throughout America and in Canada as well, um, other places have just been backing down and shutting down. And this is a call to stand upon Christ's word and be faithful. So we're going to have Pastor James Coates from Alberta, Canada with us. We're going to have Conrad and Bayway, Vody Bauckham, Travis Allen, yourself, you'll be preaching, I'll be preaching. That's going to be a wonderful time. We would love for you to join us. Yes. And you know, we just got information uh, recently that the red registrations are increasing pretty rapidly. We're way ahead of schedule from where we were last year, if you just compare. And last year we sold out, so it's not uh, going to be unexpected if we sell out again. So we'd love to have you, but uh, don't delay in registering. And if you need more information, you can go to founders.org and find out all that you want to know about the conference there. Yes. And if you're not a part of our Founders Alliance membership, you can go to founders.org to find out more about what it means to join the fam. These are people that support us on a regular basis. And through that partnership, we're able to do uh, so much of the work that we're presently engaged in. We have the Wield the Soars uh, documentary, which is going on. Um, and so lots of good different initiatives that are fueled by your monthly support. Well, it's great to be here today with special guests. We've got uh, Don Vinot. Did I say your name properly? Vino. Vino. I wasn't even close. So, <laughs> all right, Don Vino and Marcia Montenegro. We're grateful for you uh, coming on the show today because you guys have written a very important book, Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret. And uh, I don't know, a year or so ago, I first began to uh, hear more and more about the Enneagram and discovered it's been around much longer than just of the last year or two. And you guys have been sort of on the forefront of trying to expose inherent dangers in this movement. And as we were talking just before we went live here, uh, this is infiltrated all kinds of evangelical places. I mean, long trusted, uh, respected institutions and churches and organizations now are advocating the Enneagram. So why don't we just start with uh, you guys give us a definition. What are we talking about when we're talking about the Enneagram secret? What is that? Well, the Enneagram comes from two Greek words, Aenea, which uh, means nine, uh, and Grama, which means written or drawn. So Enneagram and it's a symbol, uh, which is a circle, and it has three uh, other figures within the circle that touch up nine points. It really came about in around the early 1900s. It was revealed around 1916 by a Russian esoteric mystic by the name of George Gurdjieff. Now, this is important because most of the popular Enneagram authors and teachers want to claim that it goes back to at least the fourth century. That's completely not true. Uh, and we've demonstrated that several times. Uh, it went from there and around the 1960s. Um, why is his name gone from my brain now? Oscar Ichazo. <laughs> Oscar Ichazo uh, pops up, a, a new ager, sort of a cult leader. Uh, and uh, he added to it from two beings by the name of Metatron and the Green Ketub. Uh, which were angelic beings of sorts. From there, one of his disciples, Claudio Naranjo, picked it up, and he channeled through automatic writing the specific types which are applied to the Enneagram. So it all comes from occultism. None of it comes from any Christian history. Uh, my first familiarity with, with it was in around 1992 when Mitch Pacwa, a Roman Catholic, uh, Jesuit had written a book warning Roman Catholics about the occultism of the Enneagram. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't think that much of it because I didn't see uh, evangelicals really getting involved in occultism from the Roman Catholic Church. It didn't really phase me. Enter Marcia, who comes out of the New Age where this really resided. Uh, and in around 2011, Marcia, you started writing on it. Yes, I had noticed um, the Enneagram in the progressive church. 
um, I noticed that at their conferences, and these, of course, were the former emergent leaders, leaders of the emergent church, like Rob Bell and Brian McLaren and Tony Jones, they were having conferences. They had befriended Rohr, or Richard Rohr, a Franciscan friar, had befriended them and was influencing them. Um, even later, Rob Bell even admitted he had been influenced by Richard Rohr for years. And it's Richard Rohr's book, The Enneagram, A Christian Perspective, that apparently was interesting to the progressives and they started presenting the Enneagram at their workshops. And so I noticed that that there was coming up at these progressive workshops. And I thought that's a little too close for comfort. Um, people are going to start hearing about it. It's, you know, might start seeping in. And so I, I did have an article in 2011. That's when I wrote my first article, the Enneagram GPS Gnostic path to the self. I gave some of the history. I gave what was going on with it. I had researched this back in the 90s for some missionaries who were in Austria and encountering it there, probably from Catholics. And so I, I knew there were concerns. I knew it had been in the new age. I wrote my article, didn't really, you know, think that much after that. <laughs> and things were kind of quiet. And then I think I noticed it gaining ground among the progressives again. And I started warning on Facebook in 2014. I started doing some posts about it. And then the big year was 2016, which is when The Road Back to You came out from InterVarsity Press by Suzanne Stabile and Ian Cron. And this book was being heavily promoted by IVP um, they were going to different places to talk about it. And at that point, I was very concerned. I still did not think, like Don, I just didn't imagine that this would really catch on. I thought, yeah, there'll be some people here and there, you know, that are probably interested and then it'll kind of just die out because they'll see this is really completely invalid and has nothing to do with Christianity. So what's the attraction? I mean, when, when you know, how, how is it used? What's the attraction? It's the attraction? a personality test, but it's not. Mm. Right. It is, it is, Christians think it's a personality test. Yeah. But the Enneagram teachers, now Suzanne Stabile is a disciple of Richard Rohr. Yeah. This is important. Uh, the next book came out in 2017 by Christopher <laughs> Huertz also a disciple of Richard Rohr. And mm -hmm. Wertz tells us that the types are not a type of person, but a path to God. So realistic reality is this. What you're trying to do is figure out which path you have to take to get back to your true self, which has never sinned or been separated from God. Instead, you've created a false self that thinks you're a sinner separated from God. And that is the core of the Enneagram. It's all about the realization that you are, have always been with God, never been separated from God. The whole idea of you being a sinner is just not true. The penal substitution is not true. The Enneagram is anything but Christian. Yeah, it is. And, and, it, and the uh, idea that Rohr sells with it, that your true self has always been with God as part of his panentheism, Right. And it echoes the um, the New Age Gnostic view that the true self it has been covered up with a false construct and with a lot of conditioning from society and from your experiences. And that's covered up your essence. That's the way Oscar Echazo taught it. And Claudio Naranjo having um, New Agey spiritual ideas also taught it. And then Richard Rohr gives this sort of semi-Christian spin on it that it's the self that has never been separated from God. And so this is really what you're supposed to do is dismantle your type because that is hiding who you are. And even recently there was a podcast from Chris Horitz where he said, you know, you are not a type, you have a type. Right. So that was his point is that this is a type you have, but it's not who you are. I was looking at uh, Christianity Today recently. They had an article. I don't know when it came out, but it was about oh, yeah. uh, pastors and the Enneagram. And so I guess there's nine different 
types or whatever points on this Enneagram that you're supposed to identify yourself sure. as. And uh, like it's got the perfect pastor, the generous pastor, the high performance pastor, empathetic, oh. uh, well studied. Oh you know, reliable, I mean, the popular pastor, visionary pastor, peace loving pastor, but with each one of them, it says the path forward at the end of it, which I I take to mean, here's how you need to overcome the negative aspects of your type or something like that. Correct. The path forward to what, what is it to wholeness, to oneness, to God? What are they, what are they suggesting there? Well, it, yes, it's, it's the realization that you are already whole. You only think you're not ah, whole. Ah, okay. You know, so your deceived self, this false self you've created, thinks that you are broken, sinful, whatever. Uh, your whole goal is to, to get away from that and following the correct path. You see, we are under this idea that Jesus is the path. No, the Enneagram has nine, and one of those is your particular path, and Mm -hmm. you have to figure that out. Yeah, so let me just, I'll read you one. It says, the visionary pastor, here's your way forward if you're a visionary. Slow down enough to deal with your parishioners' feelings, questions, concerns, and make the effort to relate to them on an emotional level. Your people will be as excited about your vision as you are. So it's like, okay, you know, you're hard driving, but you got to do it this way, and that gets you in touch, I guess, with your authentic self that will then resonate with other right. people's authentic selves yeah right. the, the, the way god the way god made you and and what you were for and see though that description you just read i mean that could apply probably to almost any pastor yeah. i mean sure. <laughs> and so it's really it's so meaningless because it has no basis in any kind of objective truth or any kind of research or any kind of study there's no absolutely no grounds for the Enneagram. It's this total, you know, uh, thing that just kind of came came about, as Don said, from some of it from spirit contact. And the type, Claudio Naranjo, who is the one who put the information of the types in, said he got it from automatic writing, which is a form of spirit contact. And then it's gotten this spin, you know, it got all the spin in the new age from union psychology. And and then the uh, in the evangelical church, you know, it got more spin to make it sound more evangelical. So we have people like Beth and Jeff McCord who claim to teach the gospel-centered enneagram. Mm. Right. So this is interesting to me right here. You were kind of talking about the history, and you know, it's got roots in New Age and all of that. But for evangelicals, you mentioned um, it's been pitched as a personality test. And mm-hmm. that so fits with evangelicals. It's just like, you know, I, I actually think there's, we're kind of connected to, we probably have bought into a lot of that new age and a lot of that pantheism kind of uh, worldview. So we're susceptible, but in order to get it to evangelicals, pitch it as a personality test and they'll really swallow this thing down. So who, who, who did that? Who kind of put that sauce on it in those spices trying to make it palatable and said, well, this is really just a personality test. I don't know well, that no one, no one, did it. N- no one has really said it's just a yeah. personality test, yeah. except pastors who are putting it into their churches. Yeah. Mm. The, yeah. The, the authors and writers don't say it's just a personality test. And right. it has, it, it, there's only been one psychometric test done to see, is it even qualify as a personality test? And it is so failed that it's the uh, uh, Jay uh, Medinwalt who did it uh, said, it's so ineffective that it's dangerous to use it. So it doesn't pass muster even as a psychology test. When I teach on this in churches, I, I tell them, here's what you're trying to find out is why do you do the things you do? That's what you're trying to find out in this test, right? I can tell you the Bible, because the Bible speaks to this. You do what you do for one reason. You are a sinner. It's really simple. <laughs> uh, if if we start serving one another, then why you do what you do starts diminishing because your focus is not on you anymore. It's on those you're serving. Uh, we seem to miss that in many churches. We're looking for quick fixes. This isn't a quick fix. This is occultic. And it takes you. In fact, Richard Rohr tells us some very important things, even about this. Uh, if you're trying to 
have a better relationship with Christ, you have to know which Christ he's even talking about. Richard Rohr tells us that the cosmos, all of creation, is the first incarnation of the Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus isn't the Christ. He became the Christ when he united with the cosmos. Uh, and he does a whole thing on the book of John and why the other gospels are talking about Jesus, whereas John is talking about the universal Christ, which is the cosmos. Yeah, he makes a distinction between Jesus and the Christ. And I heard him say this in a video interview in 20, I think it was 2013. When, and I wrote my first Facebook post, I think, on, on this program where he, a priest was interviewing him. And I, I had listened to it four times to make sure I was not misunderstanding what he was saying, you know, when he said the Christ began uh, with the Big Bang, you know, 50 billion years ago or however many years he said. And what he meant was that he, does, he isn't saying the Christ had a point of creation, but he's saying that was the first incarnation of Christ, which at that, at that time, I didn't understand he was saying that, but I knew he was talking about another Christ, obviously, and then he made a distinction between Jesus and the Christ. And so I was writing on that. And later, I, you know, I came to understand him better after listening to him numerous, numerous times I've listened to Richard Rohr. Um, and I've read The Universal Christ. And I just, I just finished reading another book by him. I've read three books by him so far. And now I'm very clear on, on, on most of his thinking about this. And so he has Jesus and the Christ and the Christ now is a, a sort of a power that is pulling everything towards a point of perfection. Right. Um, he got this from Tyre de Chardin who said that Christ, the cosmic Christ was pulling everything towards an omega point. And uh, Richard Rohr was very influenced by Tyre de Chardin and he, he has that philosophy as part of his philosophy. So he, he'll even say things like, he had this on his website, it may still be there for the Universal Christ book. Jesus is holding the kite and the kite is Christ and it is flying way above. And so everyone can see the Christ, they don't necessarily see Jesus holding the kite. That's one way, that's one way he puts it. So uh, I have two questions and I'd uh, love for both of you to speak to them. You, you both kind of signaled that when this was, when you were kind of watching it bubble up uh, years back, you thought, well, you know, this really won't take hold in the evangelical world. And so the first question is, you know, why did you at that time think it would not take hold? Uh, the second question is now that you've seen it really kind of make its way. Um, why, what is it about evangelicals? that make them susceptible have you gotten clarity as to oh yeah it did and here's why it did kind of make its way through the evangelical community well don and i probably have our i don't know if we have the same thoughts on it but my thoughts are i didn't think it would take hold because i thought people would investigate and discover that this was really a new age tool and it had no psychological validity i thought once they really check it out you know they're gonna they're gonna see that it's just gonna sound strange that here's this figure with nine points on it and you're you're one of these types and i thought it's so arbitrary you know why are there nine and why do they have these names so i guess i was kind of uh, naive and a little uh, more optimistic than i should have been <laughs> um even though i'd seen other new age things come into the church and then now once it took hold and just became this raging um, popular tool, you know, and now after having talked to many, many Christians who were involved with it or who were concerned with it, I think that, I think there's something in the evangelical church that likes to jump on new things and something that seems new. It's very, it's, and it's also pragmatic. Here's a tool and you can use this and it will help you do ABC. Mm -hmm. So there's a pragmatism in the church because I noticed that things that are popular a lot of times are like three steps to this and seven steps to that. And sure. so it's pragmatic 
it's about you. And I think the church has become more self-oriented. So it's all about you. And I think that naturally appeals to the fallen self. So I think those two things, plus their trust in pastors, as John said earlier. They're naturally, that's really key. I think that's why it became embraced. Uh, we talk about this in a couple of ways. You were talking about three steps to this, four steps to that. When we had to deal with Bill Gothard and ultimately had to write a book about it, what was appealing about Bill Gothard was he said, I can figure out why you're having problems. You don't have uh, the proper view of authority. Well, he had a false definition of authority, but no one really checked him on that. Uh, and everything else came from that. If you do three steps of this, the seven steps of that, the seven basic principles, your life will be great. Mm -hmm. And so he really caught on. Why? Because pastors started sending their people to his seminars. Uh, in 2000, we dealt with Gwen Shamblin. She had invaded the church. When, when we realized she was even there, she was in... Um, 30,000 churches across 60 denominations. It was unbelievable. And she denies the deity of Christ and the Trinity, but no one bothered to ask her why. Because she was offering weight loss programs and no one thought there's theology involved with it. They didn't ask the right question. This is the same thing mm -hmm. uh, as it came into the church through InterVarsity Press. Is InterVarsity Press a Christian publisher? Most people think yes. There's this idea that Christian publishers actually have people who are theologically astute checking out the material that they are printing. It yeah. isn't true. Right. So they trust InterVarsity Press. Suzanne Stabile, they don't know who she is, but it's InterVarsity Press. She sells 500,000 copies of her book through InterVarsity Press. Uh, Zondervan gets in the act in 2017, one year later. Why? There's money here. Christopher Huertz, trained by Richard Rohr and um, New Age psychic Helen Palmer, as was Suzanne Stabile, is published. He sells over 100,000 copies. The next year in 2018, InterVarsity Press publishes another book by Suzanne Stabile, instant bestseller. In 2019, Beth McCord, trained by New Age psychic Helen Palmer and five other New yeah, Agers. Yeah, she had, she had six or seven New Age teachers. Right, correct. Uh, and she is now sold by Thomas Nelson Publishers, a nine-volume set. That's when we decided to write a book. At this point, we are the one book out there dealing with this. Yeah. There are 35 pro Enneagram titles by Christian publishing houses and promoted by pastors celebrity pastors across the nation that's why christians are buying into it because they trust the pastors and the publishers yeah and nobody's investigating you know sometimes i would get messages or comments on facebook um, from people who said you know i just something about it seemed kind of off to me and so i started you know googling and everything and i found your article and now i'm glad i found it because you know, it, it verifies my my uh, my suspicion. So some people, you know, really did have that kind of reaction, and then they would investigate. But too many people are not investigating, and they're taking other people's words for it. They think, like Don said, these publishers. They think, well, these publishers wouldn't sure. vet it. You know, why would they publish a whole book on something that was invalid and was new age? <laughs> And so people just, and they just accept it. And then they push back because then they don't want to hear the facts because they've done it or they mm -hmm. think it's helped them or they've taken a, you know, taken a workshop or their pastor introduced it. And so there they are and they're thinking, well, you know, Marsha, you just, you're just overreacting because you were in the new age or they, they actually sometimes don't believe what I'm saying. I've had people tell me they've shared my information and the reaction was, she doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> and that was actually, I, I'm actually just giving the facts. Um, right. So it, it's really, it's hard now because it's become so entrenched. Yeah, it's been uh, interesting to hear the way you have articulated some of the um, underpinnings of the Enneagram. And one thing you've mentioned, I think you both have signaled uh, Gnosticism. And we're, we're seeing that kind of the same um, 
framework applied in different areas and popping up in different areas. But just for the Enneagram, what what does the Enneagram have to do with Gnosticism? Well, I think the idea of the true self, the idea that um, what you see, just uh, not just about who you are, but just about reality, is this um, is this temporary kind of manifestation. And there's behind all of this or underneath all this is this truth that you have to discover. You don't naturally know it. You have to discover it. It's something that you have to be led to through other teachings or through some kind of tool. And I mean, that's what the Enneagram supposedly is. And that's how it's taught in the new age. So it's, and this goes with new age thinking because that's how new age think. They think that the real, you know, real truth, um, and, and then they don't even believe in absolute truth, but they, they will talk about truth. <laughs> Real truth is hidden or your truth is hidden somehow. And you've been fooled. You're, you're asleep and you have to be awakened to the truth. And that's a very, to me, that's a very Gnostic kind of way of approaching things. And that the Enneagram fits into that. Well, this has been fascinating, and uh, once again, we see just how susceptible evangelicals are to these kinds of uh, ideologies and these philosophies that are not according to Christ. It's another call to the church to up our discipleship, to take seriously the Word of God, and to be willing to test every spirit to see if these are indeed from God. And pastors, that, that's on our shoulders primarily. So if you have uh, been influenced by this, bought into this, or you have heard the those that you respect talk about the Enneagram. We want to encourage you to get this book, Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret, and read about its history, read about the, uh, the, not just the places that it comes from, but the ways that it is infiltrating our evangelical world today and be prepared to stand against it, teach your people so that as they confront it in the workplace or any other uh, avenues where they would have access to this information, they'll know how to evaluate it. Don and Marsha, thank you so much for joining us on the Sword and Trial today. Okay, and we have a website, yes. EnneagramSecret.com. EnneagramSecret.com. Tons of videos on there, uh, several places you can order the book from. EnneagramSecret.com. Wonderful. Thank you for that.